الحمد لله رب العالمين نحمده سبحانه وتعالى حمد المعترفين بأنعمه العظيمة وآلائه الجسيمة اللهم لك الحمد أنت أحق أن تحمد ولك الشكر أنت أحق أن تشكر وأنت على كل شيء قدير لك العتبة حتى ترضى ولا حول ولا قوة لنا إلا بك وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبد الله ورسوله وصفيه من خلقه وحبيبه بلغ رسالة وأدى الأمانة ونصح الأمة وكشف الغمة وجاهد في الله حق الجهاد حتى أتاه اليقين اللهم صل وسلم وزد وبارك على الحبيب المصطفى محمد وعلى آله وأصحابه وأتباعه ومن اهتدى بهديه وعمل بسنته إلى يوم الدين وارض اللهم عنا معهم بفضلك وكرمك يا أرحم الراحمين اللهم آمين I praise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala endlessly is in his glory the creator of heavens and earth the provider, the cherisher, the sustainer, the bestower of bounties the source of every good I thank Allah for the blessings that he has granted me and my loved ones. I express my gratitude to the Lord in words and actions. And I say Alhamdulillah for blessings I know and blessings I know not. I bear witness that there is no deity worthy of worship save Allah. And I bear witness that Muhammad is Allah's final prophet and messenger, the bearer of glad tidings, the role model to be followed. I thank Allah for the blessing that is Muhammad and I ask Allah to give us the strength to walk in the footsteps of Muhammad and to follow the example of Muhammad and to live by the legacy of Muhammad. Allahumma ameen. I ask Allah to extend his blessings to the Prophet's family and his descendants, to his companions and followers and the men and women that walk in their footsteps and I ask Allah to make us among them. Ameen. My dear brothers and sisters, I greet you with the greeting of Islam. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Many of us, if not all of us, are watching the public spectacle that is the impeachment of President Trump. Some are watching with dismay and disgust. Some are watching with amusement. And most are watching with indifference because the state of American politics, unfortunately, has become so sickening to watch and observe. But the president has been impeached, and that I think is good news for many. And he joins the cohort of other presidents that were impeached before, Andrew Johnson and Bill Clinton. The thing is though, in American history, uh, there was no president that was actually impeached that eventually was removed from office. So most likely, what's going to happen in the next few months is absolutely nothing. Uh, at least that is my prediction. I hope I'm wrong about this. But, you know, listening to NPR the last few weeks and being so fixated on this particular phenomenon, I started thinking a little bit more about the justice system because the impeachment essentially is a trial. You're putting someone on a trial and you're trying to convict them. Now, conviction in this case does not necessarily mean that that person will be going to jail, but they will be convicted of something nonetheless. And I realized that the institutions of justice made by man are usually designed to achieve one of two things, depending on where you're looking at it. If you are the prosecution, your end goal is to generate enough witnesses and enough evidence in order to prove that someone is guilty and get a conviction. Right? If you are the defense, then you produce alibis and counter evidence and counter witnesses in order to basically get someone off the hook, in order to release someone or dismiss a trial or to prove the innocence of somebody. Ultimately, though, those man made justice systems, even in the most advanced societies, are riddled with corruption and inefficiencies and all types of outside influences. Justice is never really blind as it is made out to be. Who you know matters a lot. 
your network, your resources, the type of financial resources you have access to, and being able to spend as much money as you can on legal representation does make a huge difference in this country. There are innocent people that languish in jail for years and years and years because they just happen to have the bad public defender or stand before a bigoted or racist judge. And there are really, really bad people that roam the streets freely because they were released for the lack of evidence. Every court is basically made of five main components, right? There is a judge, there is jury, at least in America. There is prosecution, there is defense. And obviously none of this would work if there is no defendant. Right? The defendant is the person that is being accused of committing a crime. Now, the end goal of every de defendant in any case, trial case, is the avoidance of punishment. All you really want at the end is to go home. If you feel that you're innocent, I don't want to have to go to jail or pay a fine because I haven't done anything wrong. So it doesn't matter how much money you spend on lawyers, it doesn't matter even if you spend a little time in jail, if the judge comes and says, hey, you're free to go, you're just going to run as fast as possible. Seeking reward is not necessarily part of the human institutions of justice. I mean, perhaps in a civil case you may sue a corporation and get some reparations or some compensation or some money back, but you cannot sue the judge for handing over the wrong sentence. You cannot sue the jury, and you can barely try to sue the police, but you know, unless they have committed something that is so blatantly against the law, you're probably not going to go anywhere. I've thought about that a lot the last few days as I examine the justice of God himself. The court of dunya versus the court of akhirah. The court of the life of this world versus the court of the hereafter. And I realize that there's a lot of differences. The essence is still the same, but there's a lot of differences. I realize that the five entities that I talked to you about, judge, jury, prosecution, defense, and defendant, are all five separate entities. But in the hereafter, I also realized that while you play defendant, God plays the role of judge, jury, prosecution, and defense all four roles, all at once. And you might ask, you know, isn't there conflict of interest? How can God be both judge, jury, defense, and prosecution at the same time? I would say to you, because there is no one else in the universe that has the nuance, that has the insight to administer the justice of the law and to still be true to the spirit and the essence of the law, and to decide in a discretionary manner when to forgive and when to punish than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There's no one else in, in the universe that has that type of knowledge and that has, that has that type of compassion. I also noticed that while the end goal of the justice system in this world is the administering of justice, whether it's releasing someone or the exacting of punishment, I also realized that the end goal of the court of the hereafter is for God to find any excuses to forgive people. It's for God to find any tiny little excuse to get you off the hook and to send you home. But I also realize this. While the avoidance of punishment is the end goal for you as a defendant here in this world, it is not our end goal in the hereafter, is it? Like imagine God telling you, you know what, you've done nothing wrong, you're good. So I am not sending you to hellfire, but you're not going to Jannah either. You're just going to you know, sit here in this space between heaven and hell and just kind of you know, do your thing. Is that going to cut it? That's not going to answer our questions. That's not going to be helpful, right? The avoidance of punishment is one step towards the achievement of the bigger and grander goal in the hereafter, which is the acquisition of reward. And what is the reward on the Day of Judgment? The reward is God Himself. The reward is the company of the Creator. 
The reward is to be with whom you've loved and obeyed and honored your entire life. That is the reward. You cannot tell me my end goal on the day of judgment is not to be punished. I say, okay, I mean, so what? You're not going to be punished. And then what? You have to aspire for something more sublime and something that is more beautiful and greater. But the court of the Akhirah and the court of dunya are also different in other aspects, right? For example, a judge in this world may actually be unjust. That is possible, isn't it? But the judge of the hereafter is the absolute epitome of justice. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, لا ظلم اليوم There will be no injustice today. No one will have to suffer unfair treatment today. They are also different from each other in the sense that your race, your background, your financial resources, your family, your network, your dad's friends, make a difference on whether or not you get trouble in the justice system in this world or not. Now, in America, it happens with a lot less intensity than it does in other countries because we still have a relatively robust justice system. But is it free of corruption? I mean, you have to be a complete alien to say something like that. There's a lot of corruption in our system, and we feel it and see it every day. In fact, I don't think I'd be exaggerating if I said that the entire justice system in America is, has been designed from day one to further white privilege. I don't think I'd be lying if I said that. I think it's true. I think most white people would actually agree with me, and they don't like it either. But that's how it was designed from day one. We have to understand that, that the system in the world still has injustices in it. But the system in the hereafter has absolutely no such thing, does it? Right? And it has nothing to do with your family or your resources or how many kids you have or how much money you have in the bank or whether or not you know the biggest shot lawyer in town. None of that matters because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, يَوْمَ لَا يَنْفَعُ مَالٌ وَلَا بَنُونَ On that day, your wealth, your children, your family, your resources, your race, none of it is going to come to your aid. The only thing that will come to your aid when you're standing before the Creator on the Day of Judgment is your heart. يَوْمَ لَا يَنْفَعُ مَالٌ وَلَا بَنُونَ إِلَّا مَنْ أَتَى اللَّهَ بِقَلْبٍ سَلِيمٍ When you stand before God with a pure heart. With a heart that is filled with remorse. A heart that acknowledges what it has done and has always aspired for being better. In the life of this world, the jury can be manipulated and the evidence can be tampered, right? But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on the day of judgment tells you, وَمَا كَانَ رَبُّكَ nasiya. Your Lord is not forgetful. Everything is accounted for. No one can change a thing. In the life of this world, in our man-made court systems, people may get emotional, they raise their voices, they laugh, they cry in the court. The defense attorney addresses the jury and they're being very loud. But on the day of judgment, the Lord does not allow people to raise their voice. No one speaks over the voice of the Lord. All the voices are muted and people are only able to whisper to each other. You speak when you're spoken to, when you're giving permission to speak when you're standing in the presence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala himself. But I think that one of the greatest differences between man-made court systems and the divine court system is in the nature of witnesses brought to the stand. You will bring the forensics doctor, you will bring the, the, the cop, you will bring the person that was standing across the street, you will bring an expert, to testify either against you or to your advantage. But there are four witnesses, and only four witnesses that will be allowed to stand on the divine witness stand in the divine court. What are they? You have heard of them before, but I will just create a list. Number one, the very earth that you tread will testify on the day of judgment and will be a witness. 
Remember in Surah Al-Zalzala, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, يَوْمَ إِذِنْ تُحَدِّثُ أَخْبَارَهَا بِأَنَّ رَبَّكَ أَوْ حَالَهَا On the day of judgment, the earth will recount its own tidings, will tell the tales of the things that it experienced, the stuff that people have done. And, you know, in Tirmidhi, Abu Hurairah says that when the Prophet ﷺ was reciting Surah Al-Zalzala, he said to the companions, أَتَدْرُونَ مَا أَخْبَارُهَا Do you know what it means, the, the news or the tidings or the stories that the earth will tell? So they said, Allahu wa Rasuluhu a'lam. We, we don't know. You know, God and His Messenger know best. So the Prophet ﷺ says, أَن تَشْهَدَ الْأَرْضُ عَلَى مَا فَعَلَ عَبْدٌ أَوْ أَمَا عَلَى ظَهْرِهَا that the earth will testify as to what people, men and women, have done on top of it. It will say, Lord, this person has done this and that on this day at that hour. In other words, every inch of concrete that you've taken to this sacred place today will testify. Every foot of the asphalt of the freeway that you've covered with your car going to a shady place to attend an inappropriate event will testify. Every time you use your, you use your legs to go somewhere, the earth will either testify on your behalf or against you, to your disadvantage. And this is something that you have to decide for yourself. You know, on the day of Eid, remember the Imams always say, you take one route to Salatul Eid, and then when you leave, you take a different route. Why do we do that? Because the more the merrier, brothers and sisters. Because we are sinners and we make so many mistakes and the earth is already testifying against us in so many different aspects. So you know what? If I am coming to prayer, I will take one path and then when I leave, I leave from another path just so that there is more earth to testify to my advantage. And you've seen it also like after we pray Salatul Jama'ah, after we finish with the Fard and people are about to pray their Sunnah, what do they do? They switch places. Have you seen that? Many of you have seen it, but you don't know why it happens, right? We switch places because I want more of the earth to testify for me on my behalf. In other words, as you sit here in Allah's house, brothers and sisters, this very carpet that you're sitting on will say one day to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, person so and so sat on me and mentioned your name, Lord, and the state of their heart was like this, this, this and that. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that the earth testifies to our favor and not otherwise. And then witness number two is summoned to the stand. And what is witness number two? None short of the two angels that sit on your shoulders, right? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala taught us in the Quran, وَإِنَّ عَلَيْكُمْ لَحَافِظِينَ كِرَامًا كَاتِبِينَ يَعْلَمُونَ مَا تَفْعَلُونَ Every single person has angels that are sitting on their shoulders. You know, see, this, is, this is God's beautiful way of, of generating consciousness in our lives. The concept of God is so elusive and untangible. It's very difficult to fathom. And so we're not very conscious of God every minute of the day. But our teachers, when we were kids, they emphasized the idea of the two angels. One is writing the good deeds and the other one is writing the bad deeds. And so my sheikh, for example, my teacher used to tell me, if you fail to acknowledge and be conscious of the presence of God, at least remember that there are two pure, beautiful beings made of nur, made of light, and they sit there on your shoulders. Ask yourself, which places do I take my angels to? What types of conversations do I have while my angels are just sitting there horrified, recording everything I'm saying? When you say a profane word, you're not just displeasing God, you're making this pure angel this poor angel on your shoulder, write it down. So ask yourself, what am I showing the angels on my phone every single day? What kind of WhatsApp videos and inappropriate YouTube videos am I watching and showing my angels? 
What kind of places am I dragging my poor angels to every single day? What kind of people am I forcing my angels to look at every day? Am I mingling with the righteous, with the pious, with the good, beautiful, kind-hearted people? Or am I mingling with people that only further harden my heart and make my life difficult? And it is also true that the angels may testify on the day of judgment and say, Lord, this was a good person. I was there when she gave in charity. I was with her when she helped a sister move. I was with him when he stood up for justice, when he helped another community, when he helped another minority. I was there when they said the truth under so much pressure, when it was easier to lie. I was there when they said no to seduction and temptation and said to themselves, I will not do or say something that displeases God. You know what? The angels may testify and say that too. Inshallah ta'ala, it's not going to all be bad. And then you're standing there all shy and your face is red and you're like, oh my God, I had completely forgotten about that. Because good people, they do good and they don't remember. They don't keep reminding others. They just do good because it's the right thing to do. And the angels will remind you. And it is also true that the angels may tell God all the horrific things that you've done. And you're standing there as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us, You're looking at what you've done with your own hands. And people who have rejected God, they will say, after witnessing the fruit of their own labors, they will say to God, I wish I was dirt. I wish I was like the dust that someone blows in this dust and it just disperses in the air. I wish I did not even exist. And then witness number three is summoned to the stand. And if you thought that the earth and the angels are going to be effective, wait until you hear what the third witness is going to say. In the hadith, a man uh, stands before the Lord on the day of judgment and he will say with, to the Lord, Lord, you are just and you promised to be just. So be just today. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will say, yeah, okay, sure, I will be just today. What do you want? He says, Lord, you have to allow me to generate my own witnesses. So Allah will say, sure, go ahead. And then he will say, Lord, I want to be one of those witnesses to testify with regard to my own affairs. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will say, go ahead. So this person will stand and weave lies and fabricated stories, either because he forgot what he did or he didn't want to remember. And after you're done, Allah will ask you, are you done? Okay, very good. Now, he will get your hands to speak. And he will get your ears to speak. And he will ask your skin to speak and your legs to speak, to either corroborate or invalidate the story. They will then ask their skin, why have you testified against me? All I was trying to do is protect you from hellfire, you idiot. Why have you done this? And then they will respond and they will say to, Allah, to the person, the one who enabled everything to speak today is the one that gave us the power to speak. So go ahead and hide all you want. Go ahead and lie all you want. Go ahead and be evasive as much as you want. The control and the sway that you used to exercise over your physical body, subjecting it to do things that violated the Lord who created your physical body for you, that sway will be over. You will be standing right here and your physical body will be standing right there testifying on your behalf. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will command your tongue and your ears. So every time you heard a bad word and you laughed and people who are constantly listening to bad and profane music that is filled with violence and the objectification of women. Music that all it does really is bring darkness to the heart, right? Your ears will testify one day and will say to the Lord, Lord, this person made us listen to all this kind of stuff a lifetime and we didn't want that. You didn't create us to listen to the F word and the S word. You created us to listen to your names being recited. 
to people celebrating your praises. You created us to listen to dhikr being made and not to do what this person made us do. Yes, it's pretty serious. Your eyes will testify as to the things that you have decided to see and witness in the life of this world, good and bad. And brothers and sisters, you need to decide for yourselves how you want these objects to testify before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on the Day of Judgment. It is up to you to decide. I ask Allah to accept our good deeds and to forgive our sins and to establish us firmly on his path. Brothers and sisters, raise your hands and speak to Allah Azza wa Jal from the heart. Ud'u Allah wa antum bil ijaba. إن الحمد لله نحمده ونستعين به ونستهديه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا وسيئات أعمالنا من يهده الله فهو المهتدي ومن يضلل فلن تجد له وليا مرشدا وأصلي وأسلم على المبعوث رحمة للعالمين وقائد الغر الميامين محمد الصادق الوعد الأمين اللهم صلي وسلم وبارك عليه وعلى آله وأصحابه والتابعين ومن تبعهم بإحسان إلى يوم الدين ورض اللهم عنا معهم بفضلك وكرمك أرحم الرحمين اللهم آمين Brothers and sisters, as this year uh, draws uh, very very steadily to its end I wanted to remind you of, um, of this very basic concept that just I was inspired, believe it or not, by the impeachment of Trump, thinking of uh, the uh, institutions of justice that are man-made versus the court of the Akhirah, the court of the divine. And I said that while uh, those courts usually have very similar components, the roles are distributed differently. So there is always um, defendant, defense, uh, prosecution, jury, judge, and witnesses, all right? Six components that basically make every court trial. Uh, and I said that the, 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 the individuals are different in this dunya, but in the akhirah, in the court system of the hereafter, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala plays the role of judge, jury, defense, and prosecution. And I said that the three types of witnesses that will testify on the Day of Judgment, either to your favor or to your disadvantage, the earth that you tread every day, your very flesh, the physical body that you have been blessed with, and the angels that basically sit on your shoulders. They will all testify. But here's the thing. The testimony of all these witnesses may still be incomplete or incoherent. Why? Because your hand will testify that you have held the stick and hit someone with it. Because that's all your hand saw. It doesn't know why you did that. And what the intention was. What if that person is a child molester? What if that person is someone that was attacking your family and you just have to defend yourself? Maybe the angels will see you going to the fundraising banquet in order to support the orphans and that you raised your hands to donate. But in your heart, you only did this because you needed a tax break. Or you only did this because you wanted to be praised. And you wanted people to look up to you. But the fulfillment of your religious obligation or pleasing God was not necessarily on your agenda. How would they know? They testify to what they see. Now what is the fourth witness that needs to take the witness stand that can somehow... Look through all of this and process the evidence and level the fields and reset the scales and bring the balance. And look at every single detail and refine everything in order to present the truth as it is. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Believe it or not, God himself plays in that fifth role. And he will testify as a witness. Allah says in the Quran, أَوَلَمْ يَكْفِ بِرَبِّكَ أَنَّهُ عَلَى كُلِّ شَيْءٍ شَهِيدٍ Isn't it sufficient that your Lord is the one that knows everything? And He's the one that can testify with regards to everything? Now I've asked again my teacher when I was younger, so God is judge, jury, uh, prosecution, witness, and defense all at the same time? And he said, yes. Because the intent of that court is to find a way to forgive you. The end goal of that court system 
is to find a way to give you an excuse and to give you, get you off the hook. If you hand over the administering of justice to any human being, they will just follow the rules that are set. If you commit these things, you are punished this way. It is only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that can ultimately say, I know that you've committed this sin, but I also know the circumstances, and I know what you were going through, and I know the mood, and I know the stimulus, and I know all of it, and I know that you have been remorseful, and I know that you regretted it, and I know that you sought repentance afterwards, therefore, I will let it go this time. Only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can play that role, right? No human being, in fact, no creation can play that role because they will be bound by the rules that are set in stone for them. The Prophet ﷺ tells us this beautiful story, and I will end with this hadith in uh, the Mustadrak of Imam Al Hakim. And in this story, he says, Alayhi salatu was salam, Yunada ala rajulim min ummati ala ru'us al khala'iqi yawm al qiyama. A member of my nation will be called upon by name in front of everyone on the Day of Judgment. And when the Prophet ﷺ says that, he usually means that this is what's going to happen to everyone. Okay? So your name is called on the Day of Judgment. فَيُنْشَرُ لَهُ تِسْعٌ وَتِسْعُونَ سِجِلَّ السِّجِلُّ كَمِدَادِ الْبَصَرِ There's going to be 99 very thick scrolls, and those scrolls bear all the deeds that you have ever done, good and bad, written down, documented, to the fullest. And then the scrolls will be unrolled, they will be opened. And as they open all the scrolls, every single one of them will be extended to the horizon. And you're just standing there looking at 99 scrolls that have all of your deeds, every single one of them, good and bad. And gradually, your spirit is being broken. Despair is nibbling at your heart piece by piece. And you know that you're in deep trouble. So the Lord will ask, أَتُنْكِرُ شَيْئًا مِنْ هَذَا Do you deny any of this? And He will say, لَا يَا رَبِّي Lord, I do not. I confess. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will ask you, Alaka hasanatan indana? Is there a good deed that uh, hasn't been included here? And then he will say to Allah, La ya Rabb. No, Lord. I, I, I think everything is here. A'indaka uzrun ta'atadhiru bih? Do you have an excuse that you would like to share with me? And then again, that is when your spirit is completely broken. And you will say to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, No, Lord, I have no excuses today. I am ready for your judgment. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will say to this person, No. There is a good deed for you that has been not been included in the record and you will experience no injustice today. So you will say to Allah, what, what is that that is not included here? فَتُخْرَجُ لَهُ بِطَاقَةً فِيهَا أَشْهَدُ أَنْ لَا إِلَهَ إِلَّا اللَّهِ there will be a note that the Lord will bring forth, and on that note, it's written your testimony of faith. La ilaha illallah. There is no God but the one and only. That conviction in the oneness of God will come to your aid on that day. But you will still be skeptical, so you will ask Allah, Ya Rabbi, ماذا تفعل البطاقة في السجلات? What would the little note with La ilaha illallah on it do? Uh, in, in the wake of all these scrolls. It's just a tiny little note. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will continue to say, لا ظلم عليك اليوم. You will experience no injustice today. And he will put the note on one side of the scale, and he will put the scrolls, all of them, 99, extending all the way to the horizon, on the other side of the, of the scale. And then the hadith says, فَطَاشَتِ السِّجِلَّاتُ وَثَقُلَتِ الْبِطَاقَةِ all the scrolls were dispersed and fly in the air. And that one note that has La ilaha illallah will be heavier on the scale. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will forgive you for it. You know, when I was a kid and my teacher taught me this stuff, I was like, seriously? Like, what's the big deal? La ilaha illallah. We, we all say that God is one. I mean, see, this is heavier on the scale compared to all the other deeds of a lifetime. In this day and age, I started to understand what that meant. I started to understand. And, and the rise of the atheist movement, the pressure that people of faith, you know, Muslims, Jews, Christians, all people of faith today, they are faced with the tidal waves of atheism. 
it has truly become very difficult to hold on to your faith. You know, like the hadith says, it has become like holding a flame in your own hands. It has become so difficult. Growing up, it wasn't as bad. But today, the very idea of faith itself is an embattled idea. The idea itself, every other factor in society is at war with that idea. These are really, really scary times. And that's why when I see young people who may not necessarily be perfect, they don't pray on time, some of them don't pray regularly, they don't dress very modestly, they may say occasionally bad words, they're engaged in you know, sometimes self-destructing activities. But they acknowledge what they're doing and they know that they need to fix themselves and they know that there is a path that they need to take. And la ilaha illallah is still unwavering in their hearts. You see that? That little feeling right there. That God is with me and he will never abandon me. That right there might be the only thing that will save you on the day of judgment. Not your deeds, just that acknowledgement that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is there and he's one and he'll be there for you. Maybe that is the one thing that will help you on the day of judgment. I ask Allah to accept our good deeds, to forgive our sins, to establish us firmly on his path. Lord, we ask you on this beautiful day that the earth, the angels, and our very physical bodies will testify in ways that will only further our interests on the day of judgment. That will bring about your content and love for us. That will admit us to your jinn. Allah, we ask you to protect us from the dispositions of our, of our very souls and from the influences of our environment. Allah, we ask you to strengthen our brotherhood and sisterhood. To establish this community as a community of love, of compassion, of justice. To make us among those who stand up when other people are hurt. Before they expect people to stand up with them. Allah, we ask you to... Make us among those who come to the aid of others, those who spend time and resources to help the weak, and, and those who spend time and resources to help the disenfranchised and the disillusioned in the society. Ya Allah, we ask you to erect the Muslim community as a community of equity, a community of justice and compassion. Ya Allah, we ask you to make us instruments of healing in the lives of those around us. We ask you, Allah, to help us impact the hearts and minds of our own people and our society at large, to maintain good relations with our neighbors, to be a contributing members of our society. Ya Allah, we ask you, as you've brought us here on this, uh, on this day, in this shape and form, we ask you to envelop us with your mercy and compassion on the day of judgment and to admit us to heaven in the company of your messenger and the righteous. Allahumma ameen.